Good morning, everyone. Afternoon, evening, wherever you're located. Welcome to another Office Hours. Um, my name is Purva Shok. Um, I'm from the Rivas community, and I'm joined by my colleague Monica Brown um, and our wonderful co-organizers um, at the Open Education Network, Karen Lauritsen and Barb Fees. For those of you who don't know, um, Rivas Community is a charity based in Canada that offers programs and resources to support open publishing efforts. Um, I'll turn it over to Karen to tell you a little bit more about OEN. Karen, over to you. Okay, thank you. We are so happy to be here with the Rebus community and all of you. As many of you know, the Open Education Network is a community of professionals working together to make higher education more open. And today is a big day in the OEN because Barb, our community manager, just sent out an invitation for our annual summit coming up uh, the, in the middle of June. She's going to drop a link in the chat to our registration. It is uh, open to everyone and free of charge. There are a few special members only events, but everyone is welcome to join us. And it will be a, a week long immersion into the work that your colleagues are doing across the board in open education. So we hope that you can join us and tune in. Uh, as for today, uh, thank you for coming. We are going to talk about authoring workshops and uh, we have four guests today who have experience designing and hosting workshops for authors. And um, if you're new to office hours, we will do about five minutes per person and then we will open things up to all of you to drive the conversation. Speaking of driving the conversation, uh, we always welcome your suggestions on future topics and guests. We will also drop a link in the chat for that. Please keep them coming. Uh, but all this to say, we know that there is a lot of expertise and experience in this room with us today. So please feel free to share your own stories, your case studies, your frustrations, your victories uh, as we talk over the next hour. So without further ado, I will uh, share with you our four guests and then turn things over to them. So today we're joined by Abby Elder, Open Access and Scholarly Communication Librarian at Iowa State University. We are joined by Lauren Ray, Open Education Librarian at the University of Washington. We are joined by Marco Cifroli Valencia, who is Open Education Librarian and Manager at Gary Strong Curriculum Center at the University of Idaho Library. And we are joined by Eileen Kennedy, who is Library Digital Experience Developer at NUI Galway Library. So to get us started, I will turn things over to Abby. All right, hopefully, a purple you nod if you can, there you go. All right, hello everyone. As Karen just noted, uh, my name is Abby Elder. I'm the Open Access and Skullcom Librarian for Iowa State University. And I hope this presentation is useful for you all. I, I absolutely love the lineup this month and I'm excited to hear what everyone else has to share. So the workshops I created for our faculty authors are specifically for our OER mini grant recipients. So they're a little bit more tailored to that experience. Uh, they're required attendance for at least one member of each team that's awarded funds at our university. So I'm gonna go through a bit of the background on what those workshops are, how they work and how they've changed over the years. The workshop was added to our program after our pilot year showed that some faculty authors who received grant funding didn't really know what they were doing uh, or who they could ask for help. <laughs> so I set up a one and a half hour workshop for all grant recipients the following year. Uh, this workshop takes a flipped learning approach where faculty are required to prepare a worksheet and review sections of my OER starter kit before the workshop is run. Uh, as an aside, these worksheets were adapted from the project plan templates for OER grant recipients at Penn State, originally created by Sarah Davis, Amanda Larson, and Julie Lang. I'll be sharing a link to those in the chat in a little bit. But back to the topic. Uh, before the workshop, faculty authors turn in their worksheets to a box folder I prepare for each of them individually, which also includes supporting materials, readings, and a place they can house their working documents so I can keep an eye on their progress. Then during the workshop, authors are introduced to support staff and we review the worksheet they filled out prior to the meeting, as well as answering any questions they might have. The structure of the pilot workshop was this. I introduce myself, the services available through me and the ISU library, and I introduce our guests in their areas of expertise. 
Then we have a short presentation from our digital accessibility coordinator on campus, basically asking, hey, please reach out to me for help throughout your project's development so we don't have to rush to make everyone's work accessible in May. <laughs> Finally, the rest of our time, about one hour, was an open discussion with time for questions for individuals to work on reviewing and updating their worksheets. Since I review the worksheet submitted in box, I know which authors have specific weaknesses and whose timelines or assessment plans are too sparse, so I can get them paired up with an instructional designer or I can talk with them individually during this workshop. Now, last year, this workshop was virtual, which changed things a little bit. Instead of a big open discussion after some small introductions, I had three mini presentations from me, our instructional designer, and our accessibility coordinator lined up. And then I set, set up breakout rooms where I could send each participant to talk with us individually about their work. After seeing the Open Ed Conference this past year, I would consider something more like Discord for this type of work in the future, so individuals can hop between channels to talk about different needs within their own power without having to be moved by me. But it went pretty well in Zoom, considering it was June 2020 at the time, and we sort of had to do things on the fly. Uh, I will say, in terms of evolution moving forward, uh, something that I plan to include in our next in-person workshop is labeled tables, like you might see at a conference where they want to encourage networking around a specific topic. This would mimic that sort of Discord channel feeling and I wanted to, uh, that I wanted to get across in our online workshops and likely be a little less chaotic than our first pilot workshop, which was held in a small room that left very little space for people to actually move around and meet with each of the staff set up there. But all right, I will leave it at that for now and let others share their experiences, but I'm happy to answer questions about our process, our worksheet, what works and what doesn't during the Q&A. So if you have questions, write them down now to ask me later. Great, thank you, Abby. And over to you, Eileen. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I was just taking notes on what Abby was saying there. It's really interesting. Um, so my name is Eileen Kennedy, and I'm joining you from the library in NUI Galway in Galway City, Ireland. Although I am originally from the Boston area, so the accent is not Irish, obviously. Um, so in my role in the library, I manage the library's makerspace, the web presence, and I'm also a member of the project team for the library-led Open Educational Resources Project. So the library has just launched an open publishing pl platform called NUI Galway Open Press. And we're kind of new to this area um, specifically, so I'm coming to you from a slightly different context. And in order to get things started and get initial early adopters inspired and motivated, we launched an OER grant program, uh, thanks to funding from the Student Project Fund in NUI Galway. And the grant divides 20,000 euro between 10 really impressive projects to either create or remix open textbooks. Now, as part of the grant application, individuals had to provide an outline of their project in terms of timeline, who it would benefit, and an estimate for the cost savings to students in terms of paid learning resources that the open textbooks could potentially replace. Um, and all this criteria was taken into account when selecting the winners of the grant. Um, so this was a, just a really good way to get people excited and active in creating OER. And as part of raising awareness, we did some workshops. So that's really where our workshops come into play at this point anyway. Um, so we held a number of live online events aimed at different communities. So this included Galway's Open Scholarship Community and also specifically NUI Galway students, both undergraduate and postgraduate researchers, PhD, just a whole variety. Um, so the events focused on a few different areas. They provided an introduction to OER for anyone who hadn't heard of open before really a quick demo of press books which is the platform that we use for nui galway open press and a q a session uh, members of the project team also presented at nui galway's open scholarship week conference and gave a live demo as a part of that as well and um, so all of those resources have been made available to view after the fact um, i think we all know that you know doing live online things during pandemic time things come up last minute and you can't make it and it's just really handy to be able to refer back to it. Um, so in addition to the things that I've mentioned, which were more based around the promotion, um, we've also created and promoted some online training resources. So Pressbooks itself has great resources that we've included on a guide, and I'll stick a link to that in the chat in a second. Um, and we've also created a few videos and host them on YouTube so folks can just look back and watch that at their leisure. 
Um, as I said, our project is fairly new. The grants were only awarded in the past couple of weeks. So at least the training that I've run up to this point has just been focused on familiarizing individuals with the open press platform and encouraging them to jump in and get started. Um, so we've already identified copyright to be an area where training resources will really be needed. And some of my colleagues in the library have already committed to delivering resources around that. And then in terms of the questions that have come up during the Q&A, they tend to be pretty specific. Um, so, for example, there was a question at one point about if someone had a lot of videos and maybe H5P interactive materials integrated into their learning resources, how would that work if they then exported this to a PDF or wanted to get it printed for students to use? Um, an additional thing that I should mention is that we had the grants to kind of get things rolling, but obviously open press isn't available only to those who are successful in receiving the grant. You know, the grant is intended to maybe pay for graphic design or copy editing, maybe promotion or creating print copies for students. But there's no reason why anyone who's just a, a regular student or lecturer who sees a need for an open resource can't jump into open press and get going. So all of the resources that we've created to support the people in the grant, um, those resources are there really for anyone to jump in and use. Um, so I will stick the link in the chat here. Um, it not only has a listing of kind of the training resources and a little introduction to OER, but it has a really impressive list of the um, projects that were funded. And my colleague and I actually just finished this website this afternoon. So it's very exciting to put it out here for you. Um, and you know, if you have any questions, I, I hope that I can answer them from my experience, but I'm sure that I'm going to be asking some questions too. So thank you so much for having me here today. Thanks, Eileen, and congratulations on the website. It, it looks fantastic and Thank I'm excited you. to it. Um, Marco, over to you. Hi, everyone. So I'm Marco Saifoli Valencia, and I'm the Open Education Librarian at the University of Idaho. Um, so in that role, I oversee something called the Think Open Fellows Program. So um, I will confess that when I saw this prompt, I was like, oh, I'm not sure if I should be in this session because we don't quite do workshops. Um, I tried doing an OER workshop in 2018 uh, when I first started this role. And I think I had like three people come um, and it just was ultimately really not a good use of the time. Um, but then I thought about it a little bit more and thought about how the Think Open Fellows is basically a workshop. It's just sort of um, much longer, right? So the way that the fellowships work is that six faculty and up to two graduate students are awarded $1,200 to transition a course to an open text um, from a traditional text. Um, the main requirement is that it's for an upcoming course at the U of I. Um, this program was founded by um, now a librarian at the Idaho Commission for Libraries, Annie Gaines, um, I think about five years ago. And the focus was, I would say, very pragmatic because we don't actually require people to use um, like five R's material, right? So you don't have to have an open license. We also allow for very low cost solutions. So we've had faculty who were doing things like um, putting together a curriculum where they video record lectures based off of the, you know, several editions older text so that it's very inexpensive for students. So basically in that role, um, I oversee the entire program. And so uh, each year we do a call for proposals and evaluate the ones that come in and then select projects. Um, and it tends to end up being kind of an extended workshop for faculty because I often will have, I would say out of any given group, at least half are generating completely new content. Um, so we tend to see more upper division courses applying for Think Open Fellowships at the U of I. Um, for other people who are maybe doing something where they can use an existing um, open textbook, like something from the Open Textbook Network, um, those folks we tend to have more sort of like a one-on-one -on -one relationship where maybe I'll work with them for um, more sort of like a reference interview if you're a librarian. So sort of connecting someone with a resource, helping them onboard it, but there's not necessarily that sort of like an extended instructional design component. So in a typical Think Open Fellowship, um, we follow some, some things that will be familiar from things other presenters have mentioned. Um, so I, for instance, also attempt to have my faculty fill out sort of a, a work plan and a vision and a commitment to what they're gonna deliver. Um, I say attempt because I actually only have about half of them um, return those materials. And so it's interesting for me to hear how people at um, other universities are able to engage with their faculty. We have a very, um, 
I always use the terminology like free range chickens, right? Like if people here are sort of out and autonomous and only minimally um, kind of engaging with the bureaucracy of the university. And so sometimes the ideas that I've had where I'm like, oh, I'll get them to fill out a form and come to the workshop in the middle of the semester and then do a form at the end. They just literally don't do those things. So instead, it's kind of a one to one thing where we tend to end up going through these different components and kind of doing a checklist like do you need help with copyright. Do you need help identifying content? Do you need help figuring out a digital platform? And then we often have sort of intensive activity happening around those things. And so in that way, I would say it's we're taking a lot of workshop elements, but kind of applying them into this um, fellowship inter internship mentorship model. So thank you everyone for being here. And it's great to hear everyone else's experiences. Thank you, Marco and Lauren. Hi everyone. Um, I just really, I just wrote free range chickens down. That was my takeaway. I have to use that sometime. Um, so I'm Lauren Ray. I'm at the University of Washington Libraries as the open education librarian. And um, I started offering workshops on OER creation using Pressbooks in 2018. Um, since that time, there's been a lot of changes to um, my workshop model, which I'll describe. Um, so originally I started offering workshops for um, faculty who had received grants from the libraries to author open textbooks and that quickly opened up to kind of general um, workshops inviting any UW um, student faculty or staff, although really aimed at faculty primarily. Um, the goals of the workshops that I provided were um, raising awareness of Pressbooks as a new tool and platform that the libraries had as an OER tool. Um, showing faculty what was possible with OER um, and with Pressbooks. Um, it was a chance for me as a new open ed librarian to learn about questions and concerns around authoring and OER that were coming up from faculty and to sort of get to know that on my campus. Um, and also for me to help build use cases to help support requests for future funding um, through the libraries. Um, so from 2018 to 2020, I offered about 15 um, introduction to Pressbooks and OER workshops and three advanced Pressbooks workshops. I would say there was like an average of about eight people per workshop and each workshop was an hour and a half. Um, they started out in person and transitioned to online, I think in um, August or late 2019, so pre-COVID. Um, I marketed the workshops um, a lot through our subject liaison librarians who message faculty in their departments, um, as well as through our campus events calendar and OER listserv. Um, and I had an RSVP model so that faculty could sign up ahead of time. I could set them up with a Pressbooks account and create a practice book for each workshop that we could work in together. That was a nice way for me to also find out like what disciplines people were coming from and sort of try to prepare for potential questions that might come up. Um, so in the workshops, I, um, I, I'll say I utilize materials from um, Open Textbook Network, Open Education Network, um, as well as Amanda Larson, who I know is on this call, Steel Wagstaff at Pressbooks, and Maria Gold, who was at UC Berkeley at that time. So I really appreciate having that um, ability to kind of utilize materials um, previously created. Um, I tried to focus a lot of the workshops on showing examples of um, how Pressbooks had been used um, to create various kinds of OER, so not just textbooks, but things like student manuals, student creative works, language learning resources. Um, gave an overview of Pressbooks, the Rebus community, um, the fact that our Pressbooks platform was in pilot and what that meant for people who might be thinking about using the tool. Um, as well as kind of basic definitions around OER and open pedagogy. Um, and then we had a lot of hands-on time working together in the practice book that I set up. So creating a chapter, adding images and media. Um, I tried to have a lot of like quiet time for people to kind of get into a book and, um, and, and practice um, creating and then seeing what other people were creating in the book, at, um, others who were in the workshop at the same time. I think that worked really well to kind of get people actively engaged. Um, I also went over, you know, general things around copyright and Creative Commons licensing, as well as best practices for accessibility and how to get help after the workshop. And then the advanced workshop um, was sort of a deeper dive into Pressbooks and talking about H5P and hypothesis for interactivity. 
Um, so a lot of the questions from the attendees are probably familiar to the others on this call who have done workshops. So um, a lot of the questions were about like, how do I promote my book? What kind of services does the library offer around marketing my book? When is my book published? <laughs> what does publishing actually mean? Um, and a lot of questions about copyright and Creative Commons licensing um, and um, how to involve students in authorship. So I think the examples that I showed around um, student authored works were really a big hook for a lot of faculty who attended. And I ended up having a lot of follow-up interaction with those instructors afterwards who were interested in replicating those kind of projects for their classes. Um, so since the COVID pandemic, um, Pressbooks started offering basic and advanced workshops for people on the Pressbooks EDU network. So I backed away from doing that myself. Um, so it's been kind of a lonely year in a lot of ways. I miss doing the workshops myself, but it's also been nice to have that offloaded. And I've been doing a lot more work with um, student authorship, working with our copyright librarian and doing sort of similar workshops, but for classes and geared towards students. Um, and those have moved into focusing on three components. So for students, um, introduction to press books, um, citation and image attribution, which comes up a lot as a big question point for, um, for students and authoring open works, and as well as student authorship rights um, and Creative Commons licenses applied to their book and chapter. And so I've started, started doing these as um, synchronous online sessions and then moved into um, creating videos that could be imported into Canvas for asynchronous um, instruction. Um, so I think um, learn, learning over time, um, there's a lot of people now on our Pressbooks workshop Pressbook platform creating a lot of projects that I don't know about. So I sort of created a monster, I think, with the workshops. And now there's sort of the reining it in and figuring out, you know, who's doing what. Um, we're not create, um, correlating cost savings for students to projects. So that's kind of a big focus for next year. Um, I think the big focus over the last few years has been experimentation and getting people excited and active with the Pressbooks and OER. Um, and then also sort of um, focusing on um, how to better support faculty around sharing discovery and marketing their work. So I'll stop there and I'll share a link to our press, UW Libraries Pressbooks catalog, which has some student and faculty authored works that came out of those workshops. Thanks. Thank you, Lauren, and thanks to all four of you for giving us an overview to your workshop programs and talking about chickens and monsters. Um, it's great to hear, you know, about workshops at different stages, things that you've learned, common questions, sounds like copyright is a big one. And to echo at least Abby and Eileen, uh, please bring your questions. Uh, this is the time when we turn things over to all of you. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat or unmute. To get us started, I'm just going to build off of that theme of many questions about copyright and ask all four of our presenters about whether or not fair use is included in these conversations. We've been talking so much lately about the new code of best practices uh, for fair use. And so I'm curious if that is also um, something that comes up frequently in the workshops and or if you can imagine it coming up uh, in the future. I can speak to that real quickly. Um, in the past, we haven't had fair use come up in the workshops very often because we need to be very uh, careful with my instances, getting people too excited about all the things they can do and keeping things as structured as possible in that first meeting helps people learn the basics without getting ahead of themselves. I think in the future we could bring it up more as well, possibly in follow-up workshops, especially now that the code of best practices exists. Uh, but in the past we have been wary about it just because uh, we have had some faculty that try to put any image they find in their book and list used under fair use. So making sure that we make things clear what does and does not count, how to go through that uh, responsibly is a, a big thing that we'll have to work out ourselves. Yeah. 
The example I can think of is not precisely fair use, but is along the lines of, I often have faculty who want to preserve, uh, I have multiple dogs working things out in here. So one is very sad as she's been removed from this conversation. So please forgive her howling in the background. Um, I have faculty who will often want to preserve one, one text, right? One chapter out of a, a traditional text. And so they'll say, well, can I keep using this? And maybe we could use it through course reserves or something like that. So that's been where I've been seeing sort of fair use questions and we don't actually have a copyright librarian at my institution so it's actually kind of challenging for me to know how to answer those i took the creative commons licensing course to kind of support the guidance there and i tend to be a little bit more freewheeling um, from the perspective of well let's try it um, but i do think that it's um, very sort of institutionally based that's also kind of how my library approaches things in general and i could see a previous library than I've been at having a much different kind of take on it. Yeah, and we um, at UW, I did not cover fair use, or if so, briefly mentioned it in the past workshops, but I think now with the code of best practices out, we've already been having a lot of conversation, conversations internally about how to like incorporate that into guidance that we're giving instructors around um, authorship and creation using our publishing platforms. Um, and so I think one of the things in addition to doing sort of the student facing instruction that I'm hoping to work on this summer is sort of um, building out um, faculty, a, a guide for faculty who are considering um, using Pressbooks for work in the classroom and, and sort of covering um, fair use considerations uh, and incorporating the, the code of best practices there. I think it's a really hard thing to cover in a workshop where you're cramming in, you know, the platform and, oh, you're excited about authoring. And by the way, did you hear about OER? You know, it's, it, it's hard for it to not get into the weeds too much when you have people, especially coming from different departments who have really different interests. So I think we have to sort of get creative around how to how to talk to talk to people about that beyond just like one on one consultations. Yeah, similarly to Lauren, it's something we've identified that's definitely going to need to be elaborated upon, as, especially as we move into more advanced training with our uh, grant awardees. So I'd say that it's something that our academic skills team in part of their development of this this kind of um, copyright masterclass, they're going to include um, that as part of it as well. Sorry, I just heard somebody downstairs is making a smoothie. Just totally pulled my attention away. Please, <laughs> Eileen, we know it is dinner time. We're slightly past where you are. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, to echo what both of you were saying, uh, especially towards the end, it sounds like copyright and fair use especially is one of those topics where um, the most fruitful results or discussions can happen once you get into the weeds. So it can be more tricky to have a very general workshop around it, although it might be useful to lay the groundwork. Um, I'm just looking at the chat and there are a few questions coming in from participants. Um, Lee is asking whether any of you have hosted a workshop at a conference um, and if that has changed the vibe of a workshop. Lauren, I see you nodding. Eileen, I know Open Scholarship Week was last week. Maybe you had one there. Yeah, so um, there was a workshop as part of Open Scholarship Week. Um, and what happened was it was, we focused on press books and we focused on Open Press at NUI Galway. But ahead of actually running that workshop, we emailed all the attendees with some information on um, press books and how to set up a temporary account so that when they got into it, they could actually you know, play around with it, even if they weren't an NUI Galway staff or student. So, you know, they could still access the platform. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say if it changes the vibe because that was quite recent. So it was an online workshop, of course. So you, you can't really interact with everyone in person. Um, there was a lot of excitement around it, which was really nice. Like the chat was blowing up and people were creating really interesting things. And I think they were all kind of blown away by the idea that everything that they were making was able to be published, that they didn't have to, to kind of get past any gatekeepers, that it could all be you know, live and accessible and used as a teaching resource right away. Um, so it was it was definitely designed to be more useful to people in our institution, just because we do have the platform available to them. Um, but the the over overarching goal of it, I suppose, was to get people excited about open authoring. And that definitely seemed to be the result of it anyway. 
Yeah, and we uh, we hosted uh, something called the Digital Scholarship Summer Institute, or have done that for many years at the at, at our libraries, um, and that was sort of done by colleagues of mine in our scholarly communication uh, department, and um, so that's a sort of summer institute that goes on for a few days where faculty and grad students register and then they can kind of choose a track um something like podcasting or um open book publishing and so with the open book publishing we've talked about both manifold and platform and and press books as publishing platforms that we had um and we did that online uh last summer and had a slack channel I think it was really interesting because we had, um, which I think just comes up in terms of OER faculty workshops that we had faculty and students who show up thinking that they want to do one thing and then they, you know, over the course of the day or the week, they discover, oh, actually, I want to use this for teaching or I don't want to make this openly licensed. And um, it can be really hard, I think, kind of thinking about the amount of effort that you put into these workshops that are meant to be very personalized and very hands on. And then thinking about sort of like what what the outcome is when, when it's not that like grant model where you really have like an MOU and someone uh, with an agreement. So there was a lot of value in that because we ended up getting faculty who I think thought that they were going to just create a book that got excited about OER and then decided to create something for their course. Um, but it, it is tricky, I think, when you're like, yeah, putting that together with colleagues and you've got multiple platforms and only a short amount of time and then um, sort of how to keep track with people. Um, so we're considering not doing that this summer or not having press books as part of that and sort of having a separate um, sort of conferency workshop model um, this coming summer. But um, that was my experience. Thank you both. Uh, looking to the next question in the chat from Amanda, this is for you, Lauren. Since you mentioned you're not tracking cost savings at the moment, have you considered moving away from that model into something else, like X number of courses revised that is more tangible? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, yeah, I think this also kind of gets into like the way that we have done our workshops, which is sort of a come one, come all sort of model. Um, and, you know, we haven't, um, I, I, yeah, and I think, I think that there are a lot of things that have showed up over the past couple of years doing these workshops that come to mind around like, what is the value of what we're teaching with OER? And in addition to potential cost savings, um, how do you measure or report out around things like, you know, student engagement, um, increased diversity of, um, you know, highlighting underrepresented voices in our teaching and learning, um, um, creating, you know, course modules that are interactive that maybe didn't exist before that are openly licensed and not using proprietary software. I, so I think all of those like benefits that we talk about in OER and open pedagogy um, are, are worth thinking about, like how to measure and report out on them, but also sort of like how to be careful to not just collect and assess the data because we can, <laughs> um, like what, what is the goal? So I guess my, my answer is I have considered it and thought about it, but I don't have a plan going forward. So I'd love to hear if others have like, like suggestions for that or have thought about, have thought about that. And, and that's also not to say that like cost savings is not important. It is, it's just, I think, been very challenging for us um, when we, uh, yeah at our institution around tracking that data. So thanks for that question. Thanks, Lauren. And yeah, if others have suggestions of things that have worked well at their institutions, um, please do drop it into the chat. And I think that discussion about um, thinking carefully about impact segues very nicely into Amanda's next question for all of our guests. Uh, do you have assessment strategies for your workshops or professional development trainings, if you want to call them that? 
um, to help measure impact? Um, and have you um, found any, any takeaways of things that have been useful so far? Do you have things you can share? I can uh, speak to this a little bit. We don't have an official assessment strategy for our workshops. It's more like, did everyone turn in their workshop worksheets before the workshop began? Uh, after the workshop, did someone come up to me and say, I really should have done the worksheet before this began? <laughs> Those sorts of informal types of feedback that give me idea of how prepared everyone is and what support they're going to need. Uh, that's a very useful for me, sort of having an assessment piece tied into doing the workshop. Uh, afterwards, though, um, again, because this is tied into a grant program, at the end of our grant, I like to, when we're in person, have an end of semester check-in where I invite all of the recipients to attend sort of an informal coffee and donuts event to talk about what they learned and what they did and share their amazing projects with each other. Uh, and the first year we did that, we got some really great feedback uh, from some people who had talked to me and asked for support and knew that there was support available saying, I was so glad these things existed. And then other people saying, I had no idea these things existed. I wish I had asked. And that's sort of the assessment that gave us the workshops in the first place. <laughs> but again, informal, I feel like is a great way to get some of that uh, feedback. But we're also lucky because we have a worksheet built in that gives us some of those other things. Uh, if you, I posted it in the chat, but the worksheet we use has an entire section in the beginning with questions like, do you understand what Creative Commons licenses are? Do you need to support or help understanding what the different outputs and publishing platforms are available for your project? And having those questions up front helps a lot of people think through things they might have thought were built in. Oh, of course, I'll use Google Sites <laughs> before that. Thanks, Abby. Marco, I'm wondering, is there anything formally built into the fellowship for your Think Open group? Um, I was thinking about that. When I started, no. Um, I tried implementing an exit survey, and I would say we've had about 20% participation with that. So it's, like I said, I've been sort of mystified at my faculty's um, sort of free willingness to kind of take take what they want and leave the rest of the internship opportunity. And so I thought, oh, yeah, for sure, they're going to fill out this assessment afterwards, and they just don't. Um, we do use a cost savings uh, measure here because, interestingly, the State Board of Education in Idaho is very involved with education in Idaho, including at the university level. And so the money for Think Open Fellows actually comes from the state board. And so um, the state board is very interested in those cost saving metrics. And so that can actually be really tough because, you know, for some of our curriculums, we've done things like we're trying to create new content, like um, videos from Native American community members who are part of the UIDaho Vandal community, talking about what it's like to be in these multiple communities at the same time. How do you put a, a value estimate on that, right? Like we're not actually replacing some traditional text. And at the same time, if I don't put a value estimate on it, then that project is non-significant to the funder of it, right? So I do a kind of, again, freewheeling, sort of loose with the accounting and just kind of an estimate on it. And my understanding is that's the way we've always done it. And I've been trying to figure out how to capture this anecdotal feedback that we get. So for me, what's really interesting about OER, um, as Lauren Ray alluded to earlier, is the DEI potentials. So how can we actually use the fact that we're creating new curriculum to improve curriculum because it's so limited, the standard narrative is extremely problematic, et cetera. So how can we use this as an intervention? And so, you know, many of the Think Open projects that I've worked with, we've ended up with that as a support where we're actually really trying to make, um, you know, decolonial or feminist or explicitly anti-racist curriculums. And we're getting feedback from faculty like, I'm seeing different students who normally don't participate as much coming out and participating more. I'm hearing from my students of color how meaningful this is. I'm hearing from my white students how impactful this is. Um, we take some of these curriculums into K through 12 settings. And so I actually heard from parents, like I'm having conversations at home with you know, my child about our native identity that we've never had before. And it's partly coming from these OERs you know, that, that we're able to put in these new curriculums. And so 
I'm trying to figure out how do we capture that anecdotal information. And just also at the same time, I'm sort of disincentivized from capturing that, right? Because some of you may know that the state of Idaho is actually very um, unhappy about anything that could be constructed as social justice or CRT, the, the banned words of the day. And so thinking about, um, you know, this assessment question is very challenging because it's like assessment for who and assessment for where. And we want to be able to tell the story accurately of what we're doing and also um, there's all these complicated political factors for some of us. Um, thanks, Marco. There is a lot of uh, stuff to sort out there, like you said, with the political challenges and um, appreciate you highlighting and uncovering all of what is packed into assessment. Um, I will move now to Deidre's question, unless anyone else would like to build on the conversation so far around assessment. I saw that Abby dropped a link in the chat there um, about an upcoming summit session related to data collection and databases. Um, in the meantime, uh, to Deidre's question, do you have any do you have structured ways for peer review of the materials? So looking more at uh, the publishing process or perhaps the potential for some of these, uh, network communities uh, who get to know each other through the workshops, is there a way to leverage that um, for peer review or other methods for peer review? Is that a part of your publishing program? This is something I actually do have a structured process for, amazingly, uh, after all of the informal methods of the last answer. Uh, so as uh, part of our introductory workshop, uh, we ask people to indicate some things about the publishing, hosting, and dissemination of their work, uh, what sort of platform they're, they intend to use, where else they want to have things archived. So I will pull things in the Open Textbook Library or OER Commons for them. And also uh, things like if they're going to do peer review, if they're going to handle it themselves, or if they would like our digital press to support them with that process. Uh, if they ask us to support it, then what we'll do is generally uh, identify five or more uh, faculty or instructors in their discipline that teach in a similar topic, reach out to them personally with a description of the text, and ask for their uh, willingness to review the book with a set of uh, questions adapted from the Open Textbook Library checklist, which I think was originally from BC campus, but don't quote me on that. All right. I see some nodding. Uh, so we use that as a base uh, for reviewers to turn in their uh, comments. And it's been very useful for us in the past. Uh, I will say it's probably not the most efficient method, because what I do is I look up similar uh, courses by course description in universities across the United States. And then I try to find who teaches those courses. And then I have to find their contact information to reach out to them personally. And that might not be actually uh, the best way to go about that, but it is helpful in the end for finding the right people who will understand the content. Thanks. Go ahead, Marco. I saw you unmuting. I was just gonna say, Abby, that's that's awesome. Um, I'm working with Abby on a, an open textbook that we are publishing and I've never been part of sort of facilitating a peer review process. And so I've just learned a lot. And I just think Abby's idea and process right there is, so cool. We don't have anything like that, but I could definitely see us like sort of trying to emulate that because, um, you know, that's obviously a big question that people have is how does this, how does this peer reviewed and how is this part of the scholarly uh, conversation in that way. So thank you, Abby. That's awesome. Thanks, Marco. Eileen, is that anything built in um, for the 10 projects you're working with? And I know it's from the student fund. So if not peer review, is there student review that you are working to do? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, at the moment, no, there's not anything built in, but it's actually something that we've been discussing and trying to, I suppose it actually it comes back to that question of impact and measuring the impact and the value. Um, and it's not just monetary. So, you know, these, these are all such interesting takeaways and different approaches. Um, peer review is something that we definitely thought about, especially in terms of when you're thinking about academics looking to uh, publish items that will progress their careers and their reputations. Peer review is such an important part of that. So I'm really interested to hear Abby's approach to it. And I think that's something that we could definitely implement. 
Yes, just echoing the others that I have a lot to learn from Abby. Uh, we don't have a structured way um, for peer review of our materials. Um, and that hasn't really come up as a question that um, faculty have brought to us when they're approaching us around publishing. Um, so, and we also, um, you know, our criteria for adding things to our sort of public Pressbooks catalog is that it is openly licensed um, and that there's a downloadable copy and that the um, instructor is responsible for copyright, um, any copyright concerns. So it's very much a hands-off, like if you meet these things and you work with us in some way or let us know about this project, we'll add it to our site. Um, and so there are plenty of things there that are not peer reviewed and that are iterative and that probably have errors and are meant to sort of change or that um, our student authored works that are going to get built on over time. And so I guess our approach or my approach has been like getting a lot of people participating and on board and um, not sort of starting with like a formal publishing program, partially because we don't have that resource um, here, but also just to sort of like um, grow a community around OER that's not, um, maybe not uh, solely focused around um, uh, formal publishing processes, although those are very valuable to know about and to build on. So that's my answer. Thanks all. So looking at the clock, we are closing out on our hour. So if you have a question, please drop it in the chat. And while you think about that, I'll go ahead and ask a question of my own. So Abby mentioned the word efficiency. And I think one of the things about bookmaking that can be such a challenge, if you'll allow the term bookmaking, is that you know it's a often multiple year undertaking and it can be hard to show progress. And then there's kind of this idea to Lauren's comment earlier, well, what is published? you know, and all of the stuff in between this twinkle in an eye to a completed project. Um, so with that preamble, I'm curious about these workshops and if any of you find that they do help with efficiency, particularly when you're working perhaps within a grant program, do you find that there's more awareness around process, for example, or you've had better luck with uh, getting deliverables on a timeline that you may have? Um, you know, if, if any of you can speak to that in particular, I think uh, deadlines within grant programs or other questions of, oh, I feel like faculty heard me on this particular step in this long process and we're kind of in it together now. I suppose what I can say to that is that we, um, we, we have a plan to sort of use the workshops is as a way of keeping people on track. So every few months there could be a workshop on whatever looks to be an issue that individuals have come up with in their writing of the textbook. In addition to that, we've created um, a team site because we all use uh, Office here where there's sort of one community manager who's a librarian and everyone who's authoring a book is in this group where they can bring up their issues and whatever comes up, if it seems to be a big issue that needs a lot of attention, then that can inspire a future workshop. And also the community then kind of keeps themselves to task and keeps themselves writing and progressing. And they can work together um, to, to, I suppose, grow as a unit and enhance the culture of open publishing. That is amazing, Eileen. <laughs> I, I just, that is amazing, Eileen. <laughs> I, I'd like to say that is I'm going to stop saying that is amazing. Okay, so uh, from our own perspective, uh, obviously my workshop is built very much around the idea of timelines and getting things structured. Uh, but what I found helps the most with keeping faculty on track from that workshop is the changing the way they think about things, what we get across in the conversations one on one and what it means for something to be finished. So, for example, we have one faculty member who had a very ambitious timeline, and I knew it was ambitious from the start. I saw all the things they were planning on doing. So at our intro workshop, I met with her and I sat down and I said, hey, this isn't 
probably going to be completely finished at the end of the day, but I think we can get you everything you need to do to pilot this in spring by that time so you can finish your final report that's required for the grant. And then I will continue to work with you even when you don't have the money anymore to make sure that you can get those edits and updates you want for the images and the additional chapters and the exercises you're planning. Because I do not think that this is all going to come together at once. And if you try to do everything in order, the chapter and the exercise for one, the chapter and the exercise for two, you're not going to get all the way to chapter 10. So instead, let's get the text together first, and we'll prioritize that in your timeline. And if you have extra time at the end, the exercises will come then. But just sort of talking with people about making sure priorities are there so something can be finished at the end of the day, because I have to present on those reports back to the people giving us money. Uh, and having something to report is better both for the team and myself so that we can build on that and grow forward. Uh, just to kind of uh, expand on some of Abby's comments there or add my own um, impressions, I guess I would say that I feel like my faculty, um, they a lot of them come in already kind of started this iterative process. So they don't necessarily come in like I've never heard of OER and I'm just sort of like walked in the door by accident. A lot of them actually kind of have an idea, but kind of have struggled with the structure about how to implement it. So I think one of my big kind of tasks as a Think Open Fellow Coordinator is sort of meeting people where they're at and figuring out how much support they need and then kind of guiding them through to help keep them on track. And I think basically having that has, I've heard from people that the structure helps them to finish it, right? And so um, to kind of echo Abby's comments, I've had some people who definitely their initial plan was way too ambitious. And I think then a big part of the work has been, well, let's scope it and scale it and uh, you know get a, a case study, a proof of concept, um, something to try out and then maybe come back for a second Think Open Fellowship. So we actually have had people who have come back for multiple iterations because they start something and it's way too big of a project. It's a whole textbook. We're creating a website for it, et cetera, et cetera. And so we'll, we'll modulize it, right? So what can we do in this first one? And then how can we come back? But I do think we hear from people that having the structure of the grant program or a workshop helps them to actually do things that were sort of at an idea stage or kind of halfway done, but they didn't have that full impetus to finish. Yeah, and I'll just echo the others around the um, challenge without structure. Um, I would say that here, we haven't run our grant program um, since I started. Um, and I think part of that was in the sort of like, uh, running into some of those issues around like how to provide support um, for faculty who maybe have an idea and have a ha were having a hard time kind of keeping on track with their project or things were morphing outside of kind of the, the original stated goals of the project. Um, and so I think that's something that we kind of need to reconsider and look at like how to sort of build that structure for faculty authoring. Um, I would say that the, the hooks though that I've found have been around sort of the student authored projects and the sort of open pedagogy class integrated um, open publishing um, where I've, I've worked with instructors who are working on their own project and then they sort of really like the idea of um, redesigning their assignments to incorporate open pedagogy. And then I've sort of worked over time, like learning lessons from what's working well and what's not working well um, with those um, student authored projects in terms of um, guidance that I can provide and deadlines and things that need to happen over. And we're on the quarter system, which is you know very short. Um, so I would say that that's where I've had more sort of traction in terms of like hooking faculty and, and, and building those relationships that hopefully um, can turn into more in the future and also help us build um, a deeper service model around um, open student work, so. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you, everybody. Um, in our final few minutes, um, I might actually ask everyone on the call today to fill out um, a form that Barb had shared earlier, but I'm going to drop into the chat now. Um, what I heard in a lot of our conversation today were different challenges that you all are facing, whether it's with workshops, encouraging faculty to complete those worksheets prior to a workshop, keeping them engaged and motivated throughout, 
Um, if there's anything that you'd like us to discuss and maybe spend another hour digging into during office hours, we would love to hear that. So I'll give everyone a couple of minutes right now to fill out that form, um, and then we'll spend a few minutes just saying thank you to all four speakers. And we get to meet a puppy. I mean, that's that's a huge bonus for filling out a form. <laughs> Yeah, just to just to um, perhaps inspire you, um, you know, we, we've talked today about how hard it is sometimes to get input. And so this is our our cry, <laughs> our cry for input. As you're filling out the form, we're trying to get the timing right. We don't want to say goodbye because we want you to. <laughs> We would like you to fill out the form while we're all here together, but we also don't want you to leave uh, without saying thank you to our wonderful guests today. So um, please join us in thanking Abby, Lauren, Marco, and Eileen for sharing their experiences, but also please fill out that form. <laughs> and uh, we're taking June off uh, partly because of the OEN summit. So we look forward to hopefully seeing you all back here again in July. And I will echo Kevin's thanks. Um, Eileen, uh, Abby, Marco, Lauren, thank you all so much. Um, it's been really wonderful to hear from all of you at the different stages of your various OER initiatives at your institutions, um, and to also hear um, about the challenges that you face given whether political climate or um, the uh, requirements of various grants or fellowships that you and the constraints of that um, that you might be working in. Um, it's always wonderful to hear from the communities. I'm looking forward to digging into the responses from all of you and from everyone else to the forum. As Karen said, um, we will be taking a month off, but we will be coming back re-energized to tackle whatever it is that you want us to discuss as a community. Um, and I will ask everybody once again, maybe to use some of those Zoom reactions to give a round of applause to all four of our speakers today. It's been wonderful hearing from all of you. All right. Karen, any final words? You said them. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Take care and we'll see you in July. Farewell.